Hey seniors, happy Tuesday. Uh, we're coming to you from our room at Ronald McDonald House. Uh, this is just a little um, video on book 22 of the Iliad, which I believe you read independently yesterday, uh, or at least attempted to. So I'm hoping today to uh, give you about 15-20 minutes of video here just to highlight some of the major um, uh, concepts of it and make sure that you have the uh, the basic storyline intact here. I'm going to read some of the parts out loud, not all of it, um, but just kind of to, more to get my own bearings and kind of keep track of what I want to say. But there are also some uh, questions for reflection and discussion that I will also um, display for you to, uh, to do in class with partners or as a whole class, however you want to do it. When I come back on Friday, and that is still the plan to come back on Friday, um, we'll kind of cover all the loose ends and uh, kind of get get uh, caught up on uh, everything that's been going on. Okay, so I am starting at uh, page 141, books 22 and 24 of the Iliad. And uh, if you want to pause the video a second and make sure you find that spot on your device or in your textbook, that would be great. You may do that now. Okay, um, I'm going to start right on 141 with the italicized section here. Uh, with some commentary as well. So book one, as we talked about the, in the first video, starts in the tenth year of the war. The plague that Apollo has sent on the Greeks is wiping them out. Achilles wants Agamemnon to man up and turn over his war prize to stop the plague. And then of course Agamemnon, out of spite, wants to then take something away from Achilles, because he's a little baby like that, and that makes Achilles uh, quit the war, which he knows that the, uh, the Greeks have no chance of winning without him. If I ever meet the fictional Achilles someday in the afterlife or whatever, I'll say, hey dude, uh, you didn't win in 10 years. What makes you think you could win later? Right, Nath? Mm -hmm. All right. Nath is over here. Don't know if you can see him. My uh, my little camera on me is, uh, I don't know, I can't see it now. But anyway, uh, Nathan is a uh, is a Homeric scholar. Right, dude? Uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. All right. So uh, I'm going to start reading right here. I'm try not to move the laptop because it makes lots of distracting noises. That's really irritating. So sorry about that in the other videos. Okay, without Achilles' help, the Greeks are at a serious disadvantage against the Trojans, uh, who are led by the great warrior Hector, the son of the Trojan king Priam. In book six, we glimpse Hector's humanity as he shares a loving moment with his wife Andromache and his son Astyanax. Book six also reveals to us Hector's pride, for we learn that although he believes Troy is doomed, honor will not allow him to surrender. Interesting that so many times in Homer's stories, the characters have this premonition of what's going to happen or there's an actual prophecy or there's some kind of a sign or there's some kind of a reading by someone but a uh, very very common theme in uh, Homeric literature. Okay moving on to the second paragraph. Hector returns to battle fighting fiercely for the Trojans. As fear grows in the Greek camp Agamemnon admits, let me scroll down, Agamemnon admits that he has wronged Achilles, that was man manly of him, uh, he sends a delegation of ambassadors to offer amends and to ask Achilles and his comrades to return to battle. Achilles' immense pride is revealed as he stubbornly refuses to accept Agamemnon's gifts. He tells the delegates that he has decided to return to his kingdom and live out his life in comfort, uh, forgoing the honor of dying hero's death in battle. If you think back to the epic of Gilgamesh, um, Enkidu, Gilgamesh's good friend, uh, Enkidu died on, basically in, on a bed over a period of 12 days, and Gilgamesh, as you recall, was bound and determined not to die a shameful death, uh, helpless, bedridden, on your back, uh, kind of a thing. Uh, he was, from his culture, he was very determined to uh, die heroically and gloriously in battle. Same kind of an idea here with the, uh, with the Greeks. Okay, in the next paragraph, when the Trojans break through the Greek defenses, Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, uh, pleads with the hero to permit him to, sorry, this is really hard to read, it's a little blurry, permit him to rejoin the fighting. There we go. Achilles reluctantly agrees, that occurs in books 11 through 15. As the battle rages, the god Apollo strikes Patroclus from his horse, giving Hector the opportunity to slay the warrior and strip the corpse of his armor. 
Uh, that's kind of a war prize for Hector, taking the armor of your opponent, especially if it's good armor. On hearing of Patroclus' death, Achilles is overcome with grief and rage. Um, vowing to avenge his friend, he finally returns to the battle and merc mercilessly slaying the Trojan forces, books 19 through 21, which gets us now to book 22. As book 22 opens, the exhausted Trojans take refuge behind the high walls of the city. One Trojan remains outside the walls. Uh, colon, Hector. Nice use of the colon there. Remember, colon always follows a complete sentence and then adds a little bit more in terms of maybe an exp explanation or an example or a clarification, something like that. Okay, and you can see uh, TQ11, test question 11, will ask you something about that. Okay, uh, let me pause real quick. Okay, and I am back. Uh, we're going to move on from there. Um, I'm going to switch over to another document uh, just to kind of show it to you, and I will finish with that document as well. You do a little switcheroo here. Okay, so um, just a few questions on book 22 and 24. I'll make a different video for book 24 because uh, these are both very, very long uh, passages here. All right, um, so here's something to consider based on what we just read. Um, in book 22, Achilles decides to rejoin the Trojan War in order to avenge his friend, or in some translations, cousin, uh, Patroclus, after Hector kills him. Um, talk about it with a partner, and do a think, pair, and share, something like that at this point. Stop the video if you need to. Can you think of any similar circumstances from history or other films that you may have seen where someone stays out of a fight initially until it becomes personal, then it gets them back into a fight? Thinking about Pearl Harbor was kind of the thing that got us into World War II. We had previously been an uninvolved, and then all of a sudden Pearl Harbor happens, the 7th, 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Uh, Admiral Hirohito saying, uh, I fear we have wakened the sleeping giant and filled him with a terrible resolve. Great quote from history. Learn your history or you will be doomed to repeat it. And then, of course, as you know, the rest of the story, not only were we involved in the Pacific theater, but uh, the European theater as well. All right, so um, take a minute and pause. Talk about any other examples you can think of, kind of make a personal connection with that. Uh, a, another similar story you know where someone was out of a fight and then became personal and they got back in. What, what would that be like uh, in terms of that? Okay, take a minute and pause if you need to and come back. Okay, don't know if you paused or not, uh, but I'm moving on. Uh, something look ahead to this next question. Book 22 also gives us a clear look at the one of the three conventions we talked about previously of having uh, how gods and goddesses interfere in the lives of humans. Um, again, you may want to take a, a moment uh, at, a, at a little bit uh, different time in the, in the video today to think of uh, another example that you know of a TV show, a TV series, a film, a book, where some divine presence interferes, it interferes or intervenes, there's two different things, in the lives of humans, of characters, and what are the results of that, and uh, does it work in favor of the humans to the detriment? Um, sure, it depends on the show or the, the, the story or book. Um, when I thought about this, I thought about Jim Carrey's Bruce Almighty, where he basically wants to have God's powers, and so God intervenes and says, oh, fine, I will give you a human uh, God-like powers. If you've seen the movie, you know that what sounds like a great idea for Jim Carrey's character at the time turns out to be much more power than he can handle, uh, hence the title Bruce Almighty. Uh, great film if you haven't seen it. So maybe not one of his most popular ones, but it's, it's worth a look. Okay, I'm going to go back to the other screen, back to our text. Okay, um, the idea of fate, not only the gods and goddesses intervening, but also the idea of fate uh, playing a role in lives of humans. Um, so there's, there's this, a lot of backstory here, but... Uh, as the gods and the goddesses intervene and interfere in the lives of the humans, there's a lot of trickery going on. Um, so as the Trojans are retreating into the city of Troy to shut the big gates and close themselves in in safety, um, there's, there, there are gods and goddesses intervening and assuming human shapes of other people and tricking people. I'm just, just going to read you this. Um, let's see here. Uh, if you can see this on the side, I'm over here, All right, a little foreshadowing here. Um, at one point, Achilles is tricked into thinking that he is uh, chasing another Trojan prince. Remember, Troy has lots of princes, uh, Priam and Hecuba, 
aka Queen Latifah in your handout. Uh, they've been very busy parents. They've had lots of sons, which was a, a, a status symbol in those days. So there are many princes or possible heirs to the throne. And uh, in this case, uh, Achilles thinks he is pursuing the Trojan prince Agenor, who is Hector's half-brother. Uh, that's another story, I'm sure. Uh, but he's actually pursuing the god Apollo, remember, who always takes the Trojan sides in this, in this story, who has assumed the shape of Agenor to lure Achilles away from the gates of Troy, thus enabling the Trojans to retreat. Apollo's deception of Achilles foreshadows Athena's deception of Hector later in the book. And if you did your reading yesterday, uh, or if you are caught up or even reading ahead a little bit to book 24, uh, you probably know what's going to happen already. But uh, basically, when Hector and Achilles square off, Hector believes that his uh, brother Deophobus is standing next to him, and it's really Athena, who t always takes the Greek side and everything, uh, and she is disguised in a kind of a shapeshifter way as Deophobus, and uh, Hector thinks that he can take on Achilles with his brother next to him, and all of a sudden Athena vanishes, and oh snap, Hector's all by himself. So kind of a dirty, rotten trick, but kind of paybacks for uh, Apollo's little trick. So just kind of wanted to point that out. Moving on to uh, next test question 12. Um, we're having this kind of discussion here and between Achilles and Hector, and Achilles uh, biting his lips says, uh, uh, Archer of Heaven, that would be, of course, Apollo, deadliest of immortal gods, you put me off the track, uh, turning me from the wall this way. So if I ask you on the test, how is it that Achilles was tricked? into uh, chasing somebody else, that's, um, that's your answer, okay? Okay, so um, kind of making long story short, I want you to look at this next section here where now <clears throat> all the trickery is done, um, all of this, the Trojan soldiers are locked behind the gates inside the walled city of Troy, and the only two people outside the city are Hector, the Trojan's best fighter and next heir to the throne, and Achilles, the Greek best fighter. And up on the high walls, Priam and Hecuba, king and queen, are looking down below at their son, who is about to face this great warrior, and they really don't want him to do this. They really look at this as, this is our son's last day on this earth, uh, which is kind of sad, because as, as proud as they are of him and as much as they love him as parents, they recognize that um, maybe Hector is not quite good enough of a match for Achilles. And they have some really, really bad feelings about this. So I'm going to direct you to um, another question on that other handout. I will also email this document if I don't forget. I probably will forget. Uh, let's see. Let me edit this just a minute. So cool. You can see everything I'm doing. Amazing. All right. So question three, consider this, as proud as King Priam is of his son Hector, he acknowledges that Achilles is a better fighter. Can you find textual support for this? So in the speech uh, that Priam gives, and I have it very clearly marked in the video here, look for the exact lines or textual evidence uh, that supports the idea that uh, Priam acknowledges that his son Hector is not as good of a fighter as Achilles. Okay. Also in Priam's speech, question number four here, he says that young men and old men both die, but with different things. Um, what are those things? Okay, Old men die with this, young men die with this. After Priam has a, a long speech, then uh, Hector's mother, Queen Hecuba, she gets her turn, and uh, she kind of declares a prophecy. She's kind of like saying, I, I can see this happening now. I see it before my eyes. I see a vision, something like that. Uh, what is the prophecy? What is the vision that she um, prophesies? and why we should say such a thing. And also, <laughs> this is, it's kind of one of my favorite parts, I just because it's, it's just weird and it's uh, wacky and disturbing, and gosh, if anybody's fallen asleep now, this should wake you up. Um, early on in Hecuba's speech to Hector before his battle with Achilles, she tries to persuade him to retreat from the fight with a very startling gesture. Be on the lookout for that. What is it, and why would she do that? Okay? All right. So uh, I'm going to go back to the other video and or the other screen and just kind of show you where we are. So Priam's speech, I have it marked right here. You may uh, take a second to find out. Uh, we're on page 143, and it starts right around line 43 or so. Okay, we're right here. No, Hector, 
cut off as you are, alone, dear son, don't try to hold your ground against this man, or soon you'll meet the shock of doom borne down by the son of Peleus. And, of course, the son of Peleus is Achilles. So another epithet there. So Priam's speech runs all the way through those lines, all the way down here, yada yada, to line 94. Then Hecuba kicks in with her part. The young man's mother wailed from the tower across above the portal, streaming tears. And, oh, there is our answer for that one question. Well, let's just do it as long as we're here. Um, just so that there is no confusion. Uh, loosening her robe with one hand, held her out in the other, saying, Hector, my child, be moved by this, this being the, and pity me if ever I unbound a quieting for you. Think of these things. That would be those that she told her. So, I mean, you can't imagine this. Imagine you're Hector down below. Achilles is facing you. You're, you're about ready to have the, the battle of your lifetime, really for your life. And you hear your dad say, first of all, son, don't fight him. Uh, you know, you're cool, but you're not that cool. And I'm really afraid of what's going to happen to you. And then your mom does that, like, opens it all up and goes, Son, remember your mother. Remember how I took care of you. Remember these. Remember, you know, who I am and how could I watch you die today and all that kind of stuff. Now, if I were trying to go into battle and my mom did that, I would say, you know, Achilles, just kill me now. I'm not even going to fight you. After. I can't unsee that. I'm all done. Just yeah, just run it straight through, or here, or off of the head of you. I don't care. Do what you want to do, uh, because I will never live another day and be the same after that. Okay, so that's we. I give you a couple freebies on that one. All right, so that is Hecuba's speech. Now, uh, let me outline some things here. Uh, what I want you to look for is kind of what I call Hector's inner argument. Um, now that his father has said a piece and his mother has said her piece. Uh, and done her things, then uh, Hector has to kind of decide, what am I going to do? I'm face to face with Achilles. Um, what are my options? So um, that starts in that section there. And uh, let's see, that is question seven. According to the reading and my discussion of the video, what are Hector's three options regarding Achilles' channel? challenge of a duel to the death? Um, I will go through that with you now. You can come back and use this question as a review. And then Answer the question for yourself or with a partner or as a group. Do you believe Hector really had a choice or was his fate truly inevitable and why would that be? Let's take a look at that section. All right, so for Hector's uh, inner argument, and again, if you already read this, this maybe this will be this helpful clarification. This is on 145, um, and I've got the highlights here. It starts right around 1, 120. So he here's Hector saying, here I am, badly caught. Uh, kind of like, you know, oh snap, I'm, I'm really in a predic predicament now. Uh, if I take cover, slipping inside the gate and wall, the first to accuse me of it uh, will be uh, Polydamus. All right, and then so basically my first option is to run. Run away! Run inside the city gates. And so he goes through that and, you know, he talks about the, the pros and cons of doing that. Um, you know, I'm ashamed to face townsmen and women. Someone in fear to me may say, oh, he kept his pride and lost his men, this Hector, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's one, that's phase one of three. Um, so there's some other highlighted um, options down here where he's saying, um, I should go meet the noble prince Achilles, promising Helen, uh, promising with her of treasures that uh, Alexander brought home uh, by ship to Troy, the first cause of our quarrel reminding us all of how this war whole, the whole thing started was Helen being abducted and or seduced, depending on the translation you read, and, and then brought to uh, Troy, that he may give these things to the Atridae. Then I might add, apart from these, a portion of all secret wealth um, that the city owns. So right here, it's, it's kind of uh, his second option here is maybe I can reason and negotiate. So I can either run away or I can try and reason with him all right. Uh, or the third thing, as you see over here, just stay and fight. Okay. And so by the time he gets to, this is a very long speech, this is where he makes his decision. Better we duel now at once and see to whom the Olympian, Olympian awards the glory. 
So those are his three options, stand and fight. If I ask you that on a test, I hope you can uh, nail those down for me. So should I stay or should I go? And he decides to stay eventually. Well, sort of. Let's see what happens. Um, so there's a lot of Homeric similes about how Achilles is like a hawk and uh, Hector is like a dove. So you got a, a bird of prey. That's P-R-E-Y. Yes, you know, hunter, uh, conqueror, not P-R-A-Y. Um, and then uh, the dove, uh, the symbol of peace. So hawk is the killer, dove, symbol of peace. So lots of comparisons of these two men. Um, Achilles makes a comment about how I don't make packs. Uh, there are no packs between men and lions. Achilles, of course, being the ferocious lion, king of the beast, and Hector, a mere mortal man. So Homer is really setting us up for this idea that Achilles is much stronger. Hector knows he's not as strong. Uh, what's going to happen? Golly gee, kids, I don't know. Is Hector going to win? I don't think so this time. Okay, looks pretty sketchy. Okay, so uh, we cruise along through here. Athena's going to get into the mix, and there's our epithet again, gray-eyed Athena. Um, she comes in, and she's going to assume the uh, uh, shape and appearance of Deophobus, uh, one of Hector's other brothers from another mother. I don't know if she is. Well, maybe she's... I don't remember. I don't remember if Deophobus is Prime and Hector's or Prime and one of his little Heidi McCatterson flings that he, I'm sure, kept around. Well, you know, it's good to be the king, I guess. Um, but um, here we have more of the, the gods intervening in the lives of humans. So if you kick down to 148, and right in this section here, 245, uh, the scale is weighed, Hector loses. And I'm talking about kind of the, the, the Balak scales, the old, it's kind of a symbol for, still to this day, in our courtrooms, uh, the symbol of justice is, is a scale like this. And so um, Athena is talking with Zeus, and Zeus is talking and um, says he placed the, the two shapes of death, death prone and cold, upon them, one of Achilles, one of the horsemen Hector, that's Hector's epithet, Hector the horseman or Hector tamer of horses, and held the midpoint, pulling upward, down sank Hector's fatal day, the pan went down toward undergloom, and Phoebus Apollo left him. Then came Athena, gray-eyed to the son of Peleus, falling in with him, and near him, saying swiftly, Now at last, I think the two of us Achilles, loved by Zeus, shall bring Achaeus triumphs at the ships, so on and so forth. So the pans being the little saucer-like things that uh, you place things on for this kind of a scale. And so when Zeus put two little likenesses, two little uh, you know, maybe action figures of Hector and Achilles with authentic battle damage onto the scale. It tipped ever so slightly, and Hector's little figure went down, and so, well, I guess Hector loses this one, okay? So there's the gods intervening, Hector's fate being decided there. So, um, moving on to the next page. Um, there's there's going to be a, a kind of a long thing here where... Um, Achilles is going to give chase to Hector. Hector is going to run uh, once he realizes that Athena has tricked him. Since Achilles got tricked by Apollo, thinking he was chasing Agenor, now Hector is going to be tricked by Athena, uh, thinking that he is with his brother Deophobus when he is, in fact, alone. So once that all happens, okay, to this great Hector in his shimmering helm replied, Deophobus, you were the closest to me in the old days, all my brothers, sons of Hecuba and Priam. Now I can say I honor you still more because you dared this foray for my sake, seeing me run. Uh, the rest stay under cover. And so he's like, oh, good old Deophobus, you're always my favorite. Uh, now while the rest of the guys have run off and hid, hid in, in themselves in the city like scaredy cats, uh, at least you're with me. And then uh, Athena plays her little trick and then she leaves him. And yes, I'm skipping a lot, but I'm trying to shorten these videos uh, so that I don't uh, bore myself with my own talking. Um, so then, uh, whoa, I missed it, I missed it, I missed it. Where did I miss it? Okay, sorry, this is Achilles and Hector's talk about where Hector says, Hey, hey Achilles, if you beat me, please at least return my body to my parents. There's that other convention. So remember, there are three conventions we're looking at. Um, the importance of... A soldier being able to have his war prizes and not losing them. The second convention 
um, was the intervention of gods and goddesses in human life. And the third one is the importance of properly treating a body uh, of someone who has died. So uh, Hector is making it very plain that if he dies, he wants his body returned. And you say, hey, look, uh, Achilles, you know, if I... You know, if I kill you, I'll be good, and I'll give your body back to the Greeks, so you should, you know, give my body back to my people of Troy. But swift Achilles frowned at him and said, Hector, I'll have no talk of packs with you, forever unforgiven as you are, as between men and lions there are none. Now, in the movie, you'll hear Brad Pitt say, there are no packs between men and lions. Uh, I think he's been maybe smoking some cigarettes or something at that point in his career, but working out a lot. I think you can find his workout online. It's pretty amazing what he did to get... Uh, and arguably the best shape of his uh, life was during the filming of, of this movie. Okay, um, I'm pretty close. I'm, I'm working on it, walking on my treadmill. Pretty close to that, but got a ways to go. Uh, okay, so I'm going to sign off. The rest of this is the fight. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, there are some notable differences that we will point out when we watch Troy. We'll have to be after break. That'll be kind of a nice way to come back. But... Um, when they uh, actually have the fight, we will compare very carefully the film version of their fight and the actual, uh, the Iliad version of the fight. Uh, one of which is, where does Achilles strike um, Hector's fatal blow? Okay, and uh, it's, it's neck here, or throat, neck, throat, this general area. And very, very important to realize that when, this, when Achilles' spear pierces Hector's neck or throat area, he does not sever the windpipe, leaving Hector the ability of speech so that he can have some dying words. Very, very dramatic, uh, very, very sad for Hector. Okay, um, so his uh, days of singing tenor in the school choir in Troy, unfortunately, are over. Okay, uh, so that takes care of question seven. Uh, we talked about question eight, being disguised. Um, so before the encounter, Achilles was tricked into chasing a god. Now Achilles is chasing Hector because um, Hector first decides to flee in battle. Um, yes, that's F-L-E-E, -E, not F-L-E-A. That's what you find on your dog. Um, question for you to consider, is his choice to run shameful in your opinion, or did he make the best choice, keeping in mind he is a father, prince, and future king of Troy? Um... Question 9, between uh, pages 140 49, Hector's fate is sealed by the gods. We read that part a little bit where the scales get tipped. That was that part. I want you to discuss that with a partner or maybe with a class. Um, does that seem unfair to you? Uh, why or why not? Why, why, can't, why can't Hector win? Why, why not Hector? Why, is, why does it have to be Achilles as the, as the winner? Uh, I think there's some pretty arguably logical answers for that, but uh, I want to see what you have to think as well. Okay, so why can't Hector win this battle for his people in the city? It would be nice, wouldn't it? You know, some guys get to win their the Super Bowl for their their families or their you know their cities or whatever. Why why can't Hector win? All right. Um, as we get later on uh, after the duel, Achilles' decision to um, to not uh, honor the pact that Hector wanted to make. Uh, he fails to return Hector's body to his family for proper burial. It was a huge insult. Um, my question to you is, was he justified in doing that? Why or why not? Again, feel free to stop the video, uh, discuss. Uh, you can do it later. You can, you know, this, these are things that, it, that I will uh, eventually ask you either in class or, or later in other assessments. Okay, the last thing, um, Paris. Okay, the, it was mentioned in this book. Paris takes Helen away from... Her husband, Men Menelaus, or Menelaus, in Greece, brings her to Troy. So she was Helen of, of Sparta, now she's Helen of Troy. Now they put together a huge army to go fight in Troy to get her back, and also for some other reasons. But um, do you blame Paris for you know taking her away and starting all this in the first place, or do you blame the Greeks for just kind of blowing that whole thing out of proportion? What, what really caused the war and led to so much death and destruction. Okay, so those are your questions. Uh, I hope that book 22 is a little bit clearer now in terms of the, the intricacies of Hector's situation, how his dad felt about it, how his mother felt about it, um, the failure of Hector to convince Achilles to at least honor his, his corpse should he fall, um, and also 
had a good look at the intervention of the gods um, on both sides, Greeks and Trojans. Okay, so uh, why are we doing all this? Number one, it's classic literature. Number two, it's challenging literature. Number three, it is referred to uh, time and time again in other literature. And if you haven't seen, uh, dude, is it Simon and Mr. Peabody, right? Um, the no. movie Simon and... No, 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 no. Or, or what is it called? Uh, Wait for it. Right. Sherman and Mr. Peabody. Yeah, not Simon. Sherman. Okay. Sherman and Mr. Peabody. Yeah. Kids. All right. Sherman and Mr. Peabody. Huge reference to the Iliad and the Trojan horse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, dude? Rock on. Okay. Uh, that's it for today. Martin out. Let's see how much time we took. Probably a lot.